um, pull it together. Let's get started. Uh, I want to say to that you're here at all is impressive. To uh, uh, the legislators, we have gotten complaints that we talk too long. So, <laughs> and uh, people come with their own ideas. I don't. I know Dave's not here. Maybe he gave up on us. Anyway, there's, uh, so I, I think maybe we'll, we'll hold it to about five, five minutes each for opening remarks, oh. if that's acceptable. And then we'll yes. throw it to people for questions and comments and, and so on. OK, um, since I'm already talking, I'll start. Um, first of all, I'm going through a Sally Field moment. Remember Sally Field, the actress, when she got an, an Academy Award and was surprised at the applause? And she said, you like me. You really like me. <laughs> and I'm, I've been getting tributes from my colleagues. And, um, and lovely resolution by this, passed by the Senate that I think I was discreet, but I, was, I sort of choked up hearing it. And actually a nice, a nice uh, shout out from the governor and his yeah. closing remarks. Yeah. Uh, it was his first committee chair. And I... Uh, I really like the. Oh, Davis here. I just commented that I thought maybe you'd given up on us. Oh, uh, I wouldn't miss today. Yeah. Um, so wonderful. I was Howard, um, uh, Phil Scott's first committee chair, and and he had said that I was an example of being fair and uh, uh, civil. And, uh, I, I like to think that's true. Of course, I had just been talking to the press earlier that day. <laughs> kind of scolding the governor for his um, enthusiasm for vetoes. Uh, in any case, uh, the big issue, I'm just going to get it, the elephant in the room and just get it over with. We have not, we are not coming back with saying, hey, we kept your school taxes down. Uh, we did. We, 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 well, down a little, you know, down some, down a lot from where it was predicted they mm -hmm. could go. Yes. But I will, will say this, that in my view, the tax problem derives from another problem, which is spending. You pay for what you, you buy, and, and, and that problem comes from yet another problem. Because the spending problem is not that our school boards are sloppy with their neighbor's money. Our school boards break their backs trying to keep the costs down. They do everything they can. Tax problem comes from spending. Spending problem comes from costs. And the school boards do not have control over the costs. And actually, neither does the legislature. And we don't decide what we want the people to pay in school taxes. We do have accountants, we have advisors who look at what it's going to have to be if we're going to pay for the budgets. And the budgets are pretty much what they have to be given the cost of things. So <clears throat> I have always regarded a study as um, sort of a booby prize. You got a problem, you, you don't, you're not taking care of it with legislation this year, you're going to study it. However, in this case, there's really, the complexity of the issue is such that I think that's, that's a necessary approach. Uh, May we, I just tag on to that? Yeah. Um, we've had, th Allison Clarkson, hi. We've had three uh, Blue Ribbon Tax Commissions looking at this. I think studies for the legislature, Dick, are... Uh, are more important than that because we're only a part-time legislature. We only serve four and a half months. And we don't have the expertise within the body. And we actually do not have fully have the expertise in our joint fiscal office right now. We do not have a person really focused on pub, uh, on school spending. We have one person, but she's... Uh, anyway, we need that, that person. Um, I, I think that studies are helpful in getting and commissions in this regard in getting a lot of the work and expertise identified, you know, while we're not there. Because we don't, we're, we're, you know, so I think as much as I agree with you, Dick, I also think they help us uh, propel policy forward in terms of putting something on the table that we can then work on because we don't have the time, but, you know, having to leave now to, to do that. Okay. Um, so. Okay, I'm trying to, where was I? 
You were you were on the commission. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the the complexity that we're looking at first of all is is that uh, there probably are ways to keep to get spending down in that part of the school budgets are how do, how do the townspeople through their taxes pay for things the state has mandated things I for one voted for that I think are good things but probably should be paid for at the state level not at the town level uh, <clears throat> say that about the feds too mm. yeah yeah I mean the unfund uh, you've heard the term unfunded mandates and and uh, there, there are a, a lot of those expenses. The other thing is that there, there are things just what are we going to do about mental health? You've got kids who are isolated, little children who are isolated during COVID, who are coming back to school and really don't know, apparently, according to the teachers, don't know how to sit still. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and just there's, uh, the study will be necessary. The, uh, another thing, though, is that if you're going to lower, if you're going to lower the school taxes, given whatever the spending is, you're going to raise some other tax. It's, it's like squeezing a balloon. Uh, and um, that is, is a hard sell no matter what you're doing. You want to tax short-term rentals? Well, we hear from the people who are doing short-term rentals. Uh, you want to tax um, uh, high incomes? And you then start hearing, including from fairly pro progressive liberal legislators who are saying, no, all the rich people are going to leave and we won't have them to tax at all. So um, that's the kind of balancing act we're going to be doing. I think I've used my five minutes if I add up both segments. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. I'm happy to go. Hi. So I'm Rebecca White. I'm one of your other three Windsor County senators. I'm the junior senator. I'm from Hartford, Vermont, and I grew up in the village of Wilder, which is in Hartford, and I now live in the village of White River Junction. So didn't really go very far. Um, uh, if I haven't met you and you don't know what committees I serve on, I'll tell you now that I serve in the morning with Senator McCormick on natural resources and energy. Uh, and I serve in the afternoon on government operations with Senator Clarkson. So we are going through an election this year. So I don't know what committees I'll be on next year. But if you have specific thoughts or there's interests that you think would benefit Windsor County, I'm happy to talk through trying to make a play for a committee of choice. Um, it's been a real challenging year, as I think all of you have experienced probably anecdotally, whether it be flooding, uh, the cost of living going up, and the decrease in what feels like quality of life, I think, for a lot of us. Um, when it comes to our benefits and our finances just not going as far as they used to, um, and having to make difficult choices, whether that be um, making different financial decisions or uh, changing your housing situation. There's, lot, uh, there's all sorts of choices people have had to make this last year that I think any one of us could list off our own personal experiences with the financial difficulties. So going into the session, we all had a understanding of the challenges that we're facing. Flooding was the main, I think, driver for me this session was how do we respond and proactively deal with the fact that we are going to continue to see increased natural disasters like flooding that we felt in July and in December. I'm extremely proud of the legislature because we passed two monumental bills um, specifically to address this topic, both of which I would say Senator McCormick and Senator Clarkson had uh, hands in. The first one is S213. Um, which we spent the morning on. It is a flood recovery bill that looks at river corridors, wetlands, and floodplains. And it intentionally changes how we permit and look at all of those natural resources with the efforts being heaviest on how do we not build in the places that are going to flood, <laughs> which might seem like common sense. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't have enough information with the types of maps that we have or our understanding of how a river can snake um, and changing uh, ways that we responded to how a river can snake. Um, like if you were dredging out a river in one area, it affects the other part of the river downstream. And a town may make a decision about a dam upstream that affects the town downstream. So we weren't looking at our uh, capacity and implications for flooding 
uh, on a regional level, and that came down to maps for a lot of it. So we spent a lot of time on that, and then as we do a mapping process over the next six years, we're also going to be addressing permitting. So you might not feel the impacts of the legislation we passed this year, but if you're interested in understanding your maps as a regional planning tool, the next six years or so will be really key to make a statement of maybe you have historical information of the river was over here at one point, or I know that they, there used to be a dam on private property over here. All of that information is really helpful and you'll start to hear from your regional planning commission. The second bill was S310, which was a government resiliency response bill. Uh, we responded quickly as communities in Vermont to the flooding. You all saw the photos of people helping people. Um, but there was basic things that we could have improved as a government to respond. Uh, that is uh, access and funding of emergency services. Um, our EMS folks, our swift water rescue folks. Uh, it includes uh, updating uh, who a first responder is. So right now, Department of Public Works folks, who are usually in our wastewater or water departments, or your road foreman, uh, they were not considered first responders. So that meant that they weren't given the same information that first responders were, or the same access. Uh, and they also weren't a part of the planning process, which we probably should have changed a few years ago. And New Hampshire beat us to it. They already did this a few years ago. So we've now made Department of Public Works folks considered first responders. Lots of other big bills. I'll just run through three others that might be of interest to folks. The first is a data privacy bill. Uh, if you are in, I would, it came out of our committee. It came out of Senator Clarkson's committee, so I won't spend much yeah, time. Yeah, but, hopefully. but uh, I would say that if you don't like the idea of your vein patterns or your eyeballs <laughs> or your facial features being stored and sold by a company, it was a good piece of legislation for you. <laughs> um, it's a scary thought that that type of information can be stored. It's even scarier to think that someone could sell it and make money off of it, especially when we're talking about our youngest and most vulnerable people, which Senate Economic Development spent a significant amount of time on, because they use that data to then sell you things um, or to sell to other big multinational companies. Uh, so you're not going to, this is going to be the first hit that you're going to see. And big tech is not going to, uh, we're going to hear more about this. <laughs> they don't like when you um, limit their abilities. Uh, the second bill I'd mention uh, would be that we worked on uh, the Superfund bill, which is S-259, which uh, looks at contributions, I'm uh, sorry, attribution science. And attribution science shows us what the impacts of fossil fuel companies and their carbon emissions have directly on the increased natural disasters we've seen in Vermont and the changing environment that we've experienced attributed directly to their carbon pollution compared to if they had not done the carbon pollution that they did. So we're going to be ideally getting financial remuni uh, remediation, I'm saying that word wrong, Remediation? I don't know. Remediation. You guys know what I'm saying. Cleaning up the mess. We're, hey, we're, we're, we're going to make them pay because, honestly, $1 billion coming out of taxpayers post-flooding is despicable when that $1 billion, you can pretty much count dollar per dollar going to a large corporation previously. Um, and then uh, the last bill that um, I would personally highlight, which is something that I was proud of, um, something called the Crown Act. Uh, so the Crown Act means that you cannot be discriminated by your workplace, by your employer, based on the hairstyle that you have. Um, you can understand that particularly for people of color who have long felt discrimination when it comes to hairstyles in the workplace, this was just an obvious step forward to make sure that we don't have those situations continuing to affect worker experience. Yeah, those would be my big ones. Kirk, why don't you punctuate the Senate and go next? <laughs> yeah. uh, sure. I mean, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Kirk White uh, represents Delta Rochester, Stockbridge, and Hancock. And my committee of jurisdiction, the Senate, they're on two committees. And they have one in the morning, one in the afternoon. In the House, we're only on one committee. And uh, my committee is Commerce and Economic Development. Mm. And, uh, and 
And a large part of what we did for the last two years was that data privacy bill. It yeah. went through the Senate, but it was House Bill 121. Oh! <laughs> and the House did a rocking job. Yeah, you and, uh, I mean, they, We you, agreed you with their version. an outstanding yeah. bill. So, um, so, I mean, that's the, uh, and I, I think I talked about this last month as well, um, because it, it required that much work. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and so, yeah, the data privacy bill, um, it, it was it was fascinating to watch um, big the machinations of big tech, um, you know, mm -hmm. the, like where they would pop up and 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 what other organizations or groups or companies they would use to represent yeah. their interests, yeah. and and if you did a little research, you could find out that in fact they were all linked together. They all belong. Vermont, give them the Vermont Country Store. Yes. Exactly. Mm. Um, and so, so that yeah, you know, and um, and there were there were absolutely time you know so 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 our data privacy bill was uh, being attacked from a variety of places and, and sources uh, because people didn't want uh, to lose the right to to sell your data. Um, you know they they didn't want uh, they make money off that. They also want to buy your data so they can target marketing at you. Uh, you know, it's it's really. I think I said before, it's no mistake that that when you know you're, like, you know, we we're all sitting in this room now. If we all have cell phones, there's a piece of data out there that tells a, tells someone that we were all in this room yeah. together. And if it happens enough times, I'm going to start getting ads for things that Becca has been looking up yes. online because it assumes yes. that we're friends and we yes. probably have common interests. Yeah. Um, which that's scary. The, the scarier part is. There uh, is evidence of of someone who has a a menstrual cycle tracker that misses a cycle, and and then you know they happen to either walk by or uh, because there's they can track where you are geofencing uh, geofencing they can uh, or or if they happen to look up you know Planned Parenthood on their on their computer. They immediately were being hit by anti-abortion groups, uh, emails, mm -hmm. mails, uh, mailing, all that stuff to try and convince them not to, because that data was being collected and sold. Um, and so, uh, in fact, there is a bill in the being introduced in the in the federal Senate by the senator from Alabama that exactly wants to create a database of every time a woman becomes pregnant that it goes that they keep that database, they can track it and make sure that she doesn't Can't go have an abortion. Or leave the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. All right, so it's that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you, you hear things about, you know, big government or big, you know, big tech and, you know, all these kind of mm -hmm. manipulating and controlling us. That stuff is happening. And uh, uh, it's pretty subtle right now, but it's there. Uh, so I find a generational age in that of people being upset about it. I, Are the older people more upset than the younger people? I think it's all, I think, I think all of us, yeah, yeah, for different I mean, reasons. Though. I spent over 30 years in the faculty of VTC. My observation of that is the very younger generation just considers it the part of being in the game. Oh, sure. And the older generation, we're appalled by our the loss of our rights of privacy, but I do think there's a generational yeah. gap in that. I think we're less, I think younger folks are less creeped out by it because we're like, oh, this is the price of doing business. But I certainly hear from younger folks who both understand the way that they have a product that they have become and the dislike of that um, but the the benefit of being able to have your uber come to right where you are yeah. you know because it's locating you is a benefit so there are benefits and trade-offs and i think what consumers now have to realize and what vermont can do is we can say we can get all those benefits without you owning and selling our stuff. Like that's, that's, they're not, they don't go hand in hand. Yeah. Well, and even more importantly, if I may add to sure, the data privacy piece, is we embedded a, a bill called the Kids Code, yeah. which doesn't, which addresses beyond selling your private sensitive personal data it, it, uh, for benefit. It, it addresses the code that creates online addictions for kids mm -hmm. uh, and addresses the code that actually drives the behavior of the use of your of your cell phone um, 
and that it that's the most insidious thing yeah. in yeah. some ways yeah. because but I don't understand so it's legislation. Okay. I don't understand how it can be effective. Oh, because it seems like it's a 20th century concept to think we have a residence in Vermont. Our, res our, our residence is in this this device mm -hmm. wherever it happens to be. So you know, I don't understand how it's effective. How a state can effectively control this kind of bad management. Ah. Yeah, so I don't know if Kurt, you want to explain some of the ways the bill does that, but it's if you for. Can do it briefly, don't go into yeah. the <laughs> Yes, just, just there's it's a how many hundred plus page bill? How many pages did it end up being? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so there's also something called a private. A very there's a very specific thing called a private right of action, which was a main point of the debate. The, a private right of action means that you can take to court someone who violates the pieces of the bill, meaning if you didn't give written consent to have your eyeball prints or your vein patterns sold, they can't do that. There's ways that you probably have seen your I agree to everything button, so that's another mm -hmm. angle, but it, let's consent. say the consent. consent so they have to have consent built into their product, but let's say they don't. Let's say they violate our laws. You as an individual can now sue that company for Remuneration is yeah. what I'm saying. Not and yes, and your attorney general now has the ability yeah. to take those companies to court. Yeah. So it's not that you necessarily have the ability now that says, oh, are you in Vermont? Click the button to say no to violating my data rights. Like, that's yeah. not what's going to happen. But, yeah. but you now have a legal mechanism to challenge yeah. them, which. And, and your jurisdiction, I mean, you're right. I mean, right, you can go other places. And there was this whole. There were, were whole debates around, around uh, you know, what if somebody is just living in Vermont temporarily? They've got a temp job. Are they? Are they? You know, so so some of this stuff is tied to your actual legal residence, yeah. um, you know, and and those pieces. And uh, uh, the private right of action has has some opt in and some opt out because uh, we don't want to limit the fact that you know, you went down to the local car store, you bought your bought a car, they got your they've got your data, right? And 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 it's okay. You uh, by buying that product, mm -hmm. you already opted in that that car store can send you mail or emails or something like yeah. that. So you're already opted in on that. What you're opted out of is that they can then sell that to this company, that yes, company, that, and exactly. they don't actually usually sell it directly. What they do yes. is the, that one thing that we set up was their data collectors. That's the car store that collected your data. Then there's data um, uh, brokers, and data brokers are the people that buy that data and take that data. Then there's data processors, and those are the people when you say, I want to know everyone within a 100-mile radius who is interested in this thing. Uh, could you give me all their names, addresses, and names of their children and everything? And, and, and those are the people that will then pass that through to the market. I guess I don't want to beat this horse anymore either, but it's unclear to me who I would sue. The company. In any way, know what company would well, we talk about? Well, we just talked about that all the, these companies are playing together, and and so and part we, part of what the bill does is it, it it actually requires them to register. Yeah. Right. So we're 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 identifying who they are, who the data processors and data collectors are. That's the big that's the big nexus in there. Yeah. Uh, we we've had a data broker bill actually for yeah. several years. Yeah. And they're required to register in Vermont. They have a fee. Uh, it's uh, you know. You know and they and so we're very clear on knowing who's operating in Vermont. Plus, you as an individual consumer, well, first I'd say so many states are beginning to pass these yeah. that some of this, the consents and buy-ins and opt-ins or opt-outs are becoming just <coughs> standard uh, on on some of the data that you have to. We, uh, but I think it's a good question, and I don't actually fully know the answer to your question of of how is it specific to just Vermonters, except that a, bun a bunch of the companies have to, to do business with Vermont consumers have to register in Vermont, that's mm -hmm. one. Also, the, the number of, of states that are driving data privacy uh, legislation are driving uh, the way some of this is designed. So, um, but it's a good, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have the full answer to your question. So it's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. It's something bad and huge. I mean, it's not people hate big government, right? Yeah. But this is the kind of thing where the federal government needs to step in. Oh, 
Oh, no, yeah. Yeah. completely. Yeah. yeah. When you get into like 50 different, you know, yes. and, things having to do with little, these global but they won't. companies. And, and I think they're on the verge of it, and I, which, which is helpful. Yeah. And, and sorry, what's I'm your name? Sure they are. Yeah. Danny. 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 The Declaration of Independence describes the power of government as, it's a great phrase, incapable of annihilation. It's in there, find it, it's almost hidden. The power of government is incapable of annihilation. Where the government, capital G, the government doesn't govern, <coughs> somebody else does. So if you, you, know, you don't want big government regulating business, well then business becomes a government. They decide, and that's certainly the case with with big tech, mm -hmm. where and and you know go back to the when we first started getting having our cell phones and our laptops, the phrase cyberspace. Go to our website. We spoke of it right from the beginning as though it was a place, and you move through cyberspace, and and indeed the big tech is the government, not the, not the people who got elected, to be the government. The, and, and they have a governing power. So my sense is, as, as someone who's on his way out of this business, um, <clears throat> is that this will be revisited probably for the rest of our lives. The, mm -hmm. It's not as though we have problems, we pass a couple of bills, done. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. Okay, uh, we're deal I'm leaving a legislature dealing with the same problems that it was dealing with when I first got elected. Yeah. I've been nostalgic. I've been looking at my 1988 campaign materials, and it's school taxes and the environment. So, health care. And health care. You know, it's the same. So, so it's, it's, it's not like we're moving towards a, a, a moment of the second coming or the, the revolution where there's a great moment out there in the future. We are back and forth probably forever. So... We're going to have to keep a close eye on this issue. Yeah. We'll be no, back on it. Step one, I would yeah. say. Do, uh, do, do we, Sandra Clark, and then maybe we'll open it up to questions. Yeah. And I unfortunately have to go right at eight thirty because I have to go to work. So my apologies. Yeah, and I, I'm happy to talk about data privacy for for weeks. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if, if afterwards, if anybody wants to right. talk about so the, all I'll, the weeds, I I love the weeds. I'll, I'll just say I'm Allison Clarkson. I'm the third senator of this fabulous team, which is a team until oh, yeah. January of 2025. We had a wonderful, we really have had a couple weeks of celebrating yeah. Dick's uh, retirement. And the governor honored him in his final speech on uh, at, at yeah. 1 10 a.m. <laughs> on Saturday morning. Uh, really spoke, I'm not sure the words lovingly, but spoke with great affection Fondly. for his Fondly. first chair in the Senate, which yeah. is Dick McCormick. So we uh, we we've been uh, just honoring him and and uh, loving him and being so grateful for both his contributions and his his advocacy and uh, his eloquence mm -hmm. and we're going to miss a lot of that and mm -hmm. uh, and his institutional memory and I've had them to keep me straight on the details yeah <laughs> anyway <laughs> it's been it, I I think Buffalo would be really uh, pleased by how. He, uh, Dick has been feted at the state house and will continue to be because it's not over yet. Yeah, yeah. we still have a veto session. Yeah, we still have. Yeah, exactly. Um, we we did a lot of other things. Uh, I'm gonna. I think we need to open it up to questions. But you know, we did. We passed two constitutional amendments uh, that will be have to go through next biennium as well before they come to the people. One is the right to collectively bargain. Uh, which we would, uh, again, not be the first state in the country to do that, but we would. And then the second is an Equal Rights Amendment. Yeah. We passed updates to our open meeting law, which we had to do at post-COVID. We, we passed a bill that requires pay equity in the, mm. uh, as we get women closer and closer to what men are paid. We're, Vermont is the best in the country. We pay 94% of what mm. men are paid. But we need to get to 100%. We, need, we actually have pay equity in the state house. We're all paid exactly the same thing. Um, uh, so we, we have a, a, a bill passed that requires you to, when you uh, advertise a job, uh, to uh, advertise a pay range mm -hmm. so, that they're, so that you don't begin uh, at, at a lower amount, which most women and, and BIPOC communities tend to, people tend to begin with what their salary was as they negotiate, not what the salary for that mm -hmm. job is. Um, anyway, we, you know, the, the health care bills, we, we addressed the cliff of, of older people going on to Medicare 
who mm -hmm. were on Medicaid, and so we have softened that cliff and made it uh, more affordable for people. And it's one of the few healthcare things we did. We created a pilot uh, as we address our opioid crisis. We created a pilot for um, uh, uh, safe injection sites in Burlington just to see how it works. Uh, and you know, we've we just did so much. It's hard to even fathom. We now have created a pilot in construction zones that will have cameras that that take pictures of people who are speeding. So it's like in other states where you have uh, uh, mm -hmm. you yeah, control automatic. speed through that. Anyway, we just did so much, uh, it's yeah. sort of hard to know where to begin. But I'm, I'm, I think let's open it up to questions because there, I'm sure mm -hmm. you have questions. Anyway, it was a great Thanks. session. It began in a really dark place. Yeah. And I think, I think what I appreciated as I did my final speech is it was a hard, it was a hard session. I don't know why it was so thorny, but it was. And we began with post-flooding and, mm -hmm. and really with our community, so many of our communities still in trauma, whether it was housing loss or business loss or what, it just so Public much safety. loss. Montpelier is still a sad place to look oh, at. Oh, yeah. yeah. And with, right for now, example, still. now that businesses have recovered in Montpelier, that's a good example. The state workers aren't back. Yeah. So they're back. They've, you know, and we've spent $40 million dollars in helping communities and municipalities and businesses recover, but but the workers aren't back to help mm. make those businesses thrive in Montpelier, uh, as so many of our workers are still working remotely. So it's it's it, you know one hand giveth and the other <laughs> isn't yet helping enable it. So it's anyway, we ended up having a surprisingly productive year. Yeah. Begun in a sort of dark place, but really has ended up being amazingly productive and yeah. lots yeah. to go. Yeah. But we we actually ended up in a pretty good place. I think so. Yeah. Questions? So, yeah. What are your questions? What has come up? And thank you for coming at seven thirty in the morning to your local library. <laughs> and thank, oh, there was a great library yeah. bill. Oh yeah, that was a, another talk, yes. great bill. Thank you, Bennett, for your uh, your baking. Yes, Bennett and Kathy. Uh, thank you. <laughs> We're so. School taxes. Can we talk school taxes? Yeah. What's your What's your question? I think. I think a solution to our property tax problem is actually rather simple. I think it lies in our state's constitution. The constitution has an education clause. The only government service identified in our constitution is education. We also have a compelled support clause, and we also have a common benefit clause. I'm of the mind that what we're doing right now with funding of public, public education, by giving money, public money, to private schools, we're violating the Common Benefit Clause. In and my opinion, public education is a, is a common benefit. Money for public education is a common benefit. I cannot reconcile how we can reconcile giving public money to private schools. And you have three senators who voted on the floor to not allow public education dollars to go towards <coughs> private out-of-state schools. Well, that's out-of-state schools. I understand, but yeah. I want you to know where we stand. I, that I was the amendment and that came out, and that's what we were able to support. Clause, I think we're on the cusp of absolutely draining us of education funding. We've had a six-fold increase in religious schools putting their hand out for vouchers this year. Six times more this year than last year. Well, it's our, our Supreme Court that has enabled that in the Carson v. Macon decision. Yes, you but know. the Supreme Court said that if you give money to private schools, then you must give money to the religious schools. Yes. There's a way through this. If you don't give money to the religious schools, if you don't give money to the private schools, you don't have to give money Correct. to the religious yes. schools. And so why can't we yes. create our voucher program so that if you give vouchers, to a, 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 a family, which, which I support. We have, we're in a 10-town supervisory union here. Eight of these towns have school choice, and they like it, all right? I think the school choice should be limited to public schools, not private schools. <laughs> we have a private school six miles away from our public school. We closed four schools in this supervisory union. That's very painful for a community yeah. to do, to close their school. We formed a unified school, all right? Six miles down the road, we have an independent school, which gets 85% of their funding by their website from the state. Now, I submit 85% public funding is not an independent school, right? They get over $2 million. If we were to require families to pick a public school and not a private school for their voucher, that would preclude them from picking this private school. If just half of the, school, half of the people that 
took that school, came into our school, we would have one million dollars more each year oh. into our public school. I submit that would do two things. It would increase the quality of education and it would decrease our property taxes and it would be consistent with our state's constitution. So for yes. the life of me, I can't understand why not arguing the merits of the public private schools, we can't follow our constitution. You, you have hit on a point that you have a strong agreement on from your elected leaders at the state level. You do not have strong agreement on this point from the administration of the governor. You saw this play out specifically with the Secretary of Education appointment, which I'm happy we're happy to talk about. We have a role in the Senate to advise and consent on appointments or nominees that the governor makes. Specifically for the Secretary of Education, he appointed someone who, in my opinion, and I won't speak for the others, but I know there were similar concerns um, that Secretary Saunders, interim Secretary Saunders, her perspectives on pro-private school and not having experience in public schools was very concerning because it makes the case for a Secretary of Education that is in favor of those things, whatever your opinions are. So you have strong votes to support public education. However, you do not have a strong backer in the form of the governor who controls the administration, who controls the education of our state in a way that we cannot. But I'd like to answer your question because I think this is the thorniest thing we're going to deal with in the next several years. The Carson v. Macon decision really calls the question on what are we going to do about tuition and sending towns. And I think you're absolutely right. I think we uh, we need to limit uh, tuition only to other public schools. I think we need to designate other public schools. We need to re-embed all that parental energy in our public schools. It has been dissipated and has gone out to uh, all these other places. But I think it calls the question on tuition. What are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, the thorniest thing. We are avoiding it. We sadly have leadership that tends to be conflict averse. And this is a huge conflict issue, even though it's only about, what, four or 5,000 kids in, that yeah. go to private schools or go out of state. This is yeah, somehow a this doesn't follow challenged It thing. seems to follow, the legislature seems to follow if they have a private school yes. in their district. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you're from, yeah. if you're a legislator from the Burberton district, you love private schools. <laughs> and and, and so, we have folks oh, in that correct. district. Yeah. We have Weston in our district. We, but and I think also you also have, have a, a Department of, uh, of Education at this point in time that's been all appointed by the governor. Their governor appointees yeah. for six-year terms, so they're exclusively there. That's a big roadblock right now. They, for Correct. example, I, I wouldn't have a problem if the private schools got money if they agreed to follow the same rules and regulations. Oh, that was Dick's bill. Have certified yeah. teachers, have <laughs> licensed teachers take the test scores, publish your test scores, have an open budget process, then you can get your money. That, that would be okay with me. I used to be the chair of the education committee. I lost that position over that issue. Yeah. Because, the, because the, the leadership was so incensed with me because I was because it caused trouble. Because we had people angry with us, including people who were usually our supporters. We have people who are, you know, progressive, environmentalist, feminist, good guy people who whose kids are going to private school on the taxpayer's dollar. And, you know, all of a sudden, <laughs> that egalitarian liberalism goes out the window. Oh, well, Hartman, Hartman is a great example. Yeah, yeah. Very quick. Yeah. Yeah. But so, I, I think well, that it's Hartman, going to be... In, in your district, where you come from, yeah, they I went eliminated to all... 22 positions and four varsity sports to pass their last, their last budget. They're 13 miles away from a private school. If just a half a dozen of those kids went down to Hartford, you'd have a whole different... Yeah, you're, you're preaching to the choir as a right. whole right. graduate from that entire school district. Yeah. But maybe we transition to a non-school related topic, unless people want to stick on this. I, as but anyway, we hear you, and it is the biggest challenge we face in many so ways. So shouldn't in public be such a challenge if we're arguing what the Constitution says? Right. No, I, I agree. Yes, we agree. I, I want to touch on a tangential issue, though, which is the governor issued a press release that was scathing yeah. against the Senate doing its constitutional duty of advice and consent. Mm -hmm. And because he appointed a, a Secretary of Education, where when I voted against her, my, sen my reasoning was, 
I have no reason to be confident that she supports the mission of the Agency of Education. That, and that is a, you don't want someone heading an organization who doesn't like what the organization does. It was due diligence on the part of the Senate to scrutinize this gubernatorial. He, he attributed it to, to partisan bickering and mean spirit. He called it a partisan political hit job. Yeah. yeah. That was yeah. a grassroots Which upright. Is, so saying, no, we've had yeah. enough of this. Yeah. As so, the majority leader and assistant majority leader of the other political party, it was not a political hit job. No. If someone was going to do a political hit job, it would have been us, and we weren't working on that. So, <laughs> But we all took time to interview her. We all took time uh, you know, we, yeah. the Senate Education Committee uh, uh, interviewed her, as the, generally happens with the Committee of Jurisdiction with an appointee, uh, a secretary or a commissioner, because we have to advise, we have to consent to all of those jobs. Um, and this is the first one in my 20 years yeah. that we have not confirmed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it was really an, an we took it as an, uh, the responsibility it was for us to understand and appreciate her background and get to know her. She's terrific. Yeah, she's I'd hire her in a heartbeat person. as our new Executive yeah. Director of Workforce Development. She's yeah, unqualified she's to totally be our lady. Secretary of Public Education. Very kind. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say, excuse me. Yeah, Laura, what's your name? Uh, what's Contrary your name? to everybody else, what's your you name? just spoke. Yeah. Kathy yeah. McCullough. That's right. And as a parent, as somebody who's also worked in public administration um, at a state college for 37 years, oh. I'm actually very pro Zoe Saunders. Okay. I've had three students. You're the first constituent I've met. This <laughs> is. I did not hear one pro. I didn't get this one is pro great. email. Tell us I got why. Hundreds of emails. Well, I'm not. I've not really been big on all this. I just recently yeah. retired. I've had my focus and <laughs> financial aid. That's been my oh, okay. my career. Um, thank you. And thank you, Dick, for your service as well. Um, and I, I watched the floor debate. I watched the video, and I saw all the commentary. And um, I do feel that we need something different. And what we're doing now is not working. We have a finance problem with the schools. She's a fixer. And you know, I'm on the other side. You know, faculty over here, <laughs> administration. So. I see her skills very transferable to what we need, and I I do agree with the governor on this. I think it's absolutely a positive, not a negative. Mm -hmm. right. And a lot of the campaign stuff that I saw on the floor and a lot of people that were speaking, there was very much, as I can see, a lobby against her mm -hmm. and with a yeah. lot of... Um, Maybe blank forms, people writing in stuff, you know, to kind of make it seem more personal. Um, yeah. No, actually, so, it, we didn't have that. That was, yeah, we, was so extraordinary. Somebody mm. said that on the floor. We, yeah, we didn't really experience, I would say, a heavy lobbying effort on our for us in Windsor mm -hmm. County. We didn't experience Some that. Some of the other senators did. Yeah, we did they hear noted. that. Yes. Um, this, there was a senator from Rotland who spoke, who I thought was very eloquent. Of course, he was pro Zoe Saunders. Yeah. <laughs> and but one of the things I don't I don't know his name because they didn't say that on the floor. But anyway, um, he had mentioned that what he saw in the education department was disorganization and not a lot of um, administrative effectiveness. And that's concerning. Oh, yeah. it's concerning it's to concerning us too. It's concerning because yeah. this is decades long. This is yeah. not a new issue. Um, I think Zoe is perfect, and I, I, I I've read her resume. Um, what what spoke to you in her resume? Well, she was a strategic her strategic management at, at in Florida at Broward County, or for um, Bezos University, or for Charter Schools USA. Her Charter Schools USA was very yes. She you, had a lot you, of that detail. was compelling. Yeah. Are you f so? Let me explain to you why that may have been compelling to you, but was not compelling to me. And the reason it wasn't compelling to me was because Charter Schools USA is a multi-million dollar corporation that goes into public school districts and essentially makes a case to take public school money to their schools, to private schools. And I worry that there is a direction that we would move towards based on that skill set. It sounds like you're supportive of that skill set because you feel we're not moving in the right direction. 
So well, I'm not getting the job done. We're not Whatever getting the job done. Whatever you want to call okay. right direction. We sure. Have finance issues. Yes. And, you know, our test scores are not where they need to be. And students are not coming out of high schools, and you can probably attest to this, Greg, with the math abilities that they need to especially at Vermont COVID. Tech. Especially post-COVID. Yeah. Well, even prior to post-COVID. Post at COVID Vermont Tech. So I had though. three daughters that graduated from Wick High School. All three of them took the VAST program at Vermont Tech. Nice. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had a math class. It was called Tech Math. It was a five-credit course. Um, tough math class. Mm -hmm. um, I had a daughter from Whitcomb who went into that program as a sophomore. Nice. Aced it. There you go. She was, a, you know, math proficient. By the time, I'm not sure when they, they quit it, probably maybe 15 years ago, they changed that math class to a two-course math class. Mm -hmm. Three sure. credits in the fall, three credits in the spring, because students could not master the class. We had to dumb down that course because students are not graduating from public high school with the skills and ability to complete that. So you're saying 15 years ago we changed the credits so that you did two years, two to terms, and then three years? Yes. So versus having that five grade, credits in one year? They well, had we, to change that math class because okay. students are not coming out so, with the ability. I, I think you're right. I think, I think our agency of education has been underled mm -hmm. and yes. without any vision, uh, without real vision for several years. The oh, it's more than several because oh. that issue has been, I mean, it's over a decade long that there's sure. been failing statistics on this. Yeah, we've had the same governor for the last six of it. You're, you're, well, yeah. it's beyond that. I'm going to say it's 20 years. Okay. So it, it, I've it, seen it. There is a serious it. morale issue at the Agency of Education. Yeah. It is. I, I come. I, I agree that we need we need new energy, new vision for the for the agency. I, mm -hmm. We just we may happily just disagree I on who that is. I but know, you're right. She's she's. I, she's, she's, I know that is good. good. But <laughs> but she's she's terrific. I mean, I think Lovely she's person. very competent. <clears throat> I I I think she. I hope she stays in Vermont. And um, she has an opportunity now as the interim to to show us what she's made of because we aren't able to readdress this issue until January mm -hmm. and we will be readdressing it in January because the Senate is not going to take uh, the governor sort of disregarding its uh, confirmation process lying down so it will be readdressed in in January but she has six months to yeah, we'll to do a, a lot of stuff. We'll figure it out. Oh totally. Um, atmosphere for her because yes. what I saw on the floor was not well, I would say she um, was not given any negative treatment through our process. In fact, I spoke with her many times. We bumped into each other in the ladies' room on multiple occasions. <laughs> um, and even after the floor debate, I said, I hope you have a lovely day. I saw her the next day. She said, thank you. I mean, there's no, I think there was this buildup of like we were going around and like bullying her when in fact it was not that way at all. Being underqualified for a job is not an insult. Saying that someone is not qualified for a job is not a personal attack. We've all applied for jobs that we thought, dang, I am, my resume, I'm going to get this job like that. I applied to be a cupcake making assistant when I was living in Burlington and I didn't get the job. You know, it's it's not an insult or a personal attack to say someone is underqualified. No, and no one true. ever commented on her being anything other than the resume as the main concern. So it, it was interesting because even in some of the press releases the governor put out, we had never put out a statement. No one had put out a statement negatively. So then he was putting out statements saying people are being negative. It's like, could you point to where? Because I watched the videos and I thought the floor debate, I mean, and I would check out other floor debates too, because we, that was a, that was a chill floor debate compared to perhaps historical floor debates on other topics um, and even in, in later days when we had Sanders stand up and um, we had to call points of order 
yeah, for you're, civility. So you're not allowed to speak yeah. uh, uh, or have ill intent so, uh, or direct yeah. negative comments to anyone. But it's so great to or hear your perspective on this. Yeah, and you. please, if you, listen. yeah, and over the next six months or however long she's there, if there are things that you like I that she's doing, for a long time. sure. <laughs> and what, how, well, at least the next six fantastic. months. Okay, so let me rephrase this. My ask of you because it sounds like you're dialed in and you know what's going on. If you see specific things that she's doing that you said, wow, that's what I'm talking about, please email us, email us, us no. tell us, because be we have only heard from people who are concerned. So it'd be very helpful to hear your voice. It'd have a different bounce. So any so, other non-school related questions? And actually, then, I have yeah, another did, one. Did, oh, Dave, oh, well, Dave, what's up? What's up? Oh, How about I got six, but four, ah, four of them have to do What's your education. top one, David? Uh, the easiest one? Oh, no, just not. the top one. Uh, who is going to be on this study committee? Because I've seen committees oh, that it's... don't know shit and they've uh, assigned a job, and they're not qualified. <laughs> it's a commission, and it is in the legislation as to who will serve on it. And when you see Secretary of Education or Secretary of something, or designee, we won't know until it's named who yeah. the actual people are. I'm talking people. about Dick's committee that's going to look at financing. Right, that we don't know. know. That's, the so that's the commission. That's the commission how to fix it. Yeah, we don't know yet. We don't, we, we know. Well, we know what office. We know yeah. what oh. offices are represented and who the stakeholders identified. I mean, there's a whole list of who's gonna be on the commission in the legislation, which we have not memorized. But what we won't know the specific people until it actually is convened because it, it will say something like Secretary of Education and yeah. or designee. So it may be the secretary, the interim secretary of education, or it may be somebody she designates to serve on that. So we won't actually know the specific. Well, we, I would like to see. We should email people, out to folks. Yeah. Uh, people on this commission that are willing to make difficult decisions because that's the problem here. We can't make a difficult decision. Correct. And you're going to piss off somebody. Oh, always. So let's. How about let's piss off Burlington area once in a while? <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. We, we I'm them sorry. Off. Yeah, they they, we yeah. pissed yeah. Burlington off. area runs from here. The what area? No, they they don't. That is so not true. That, that is not true. We, uh, I, if I could have what I want, we would have Chittenden County and we'd have Vermont. <laughs> we, sound, <laughs> we sound like members of my do. family. Yeah. Well, on tro on the troublesome is the what goes on up in Chittenden County is passed on to the rest of Vermont. Oh. So, well, well, people well. in upstate New York will say that New York City runs everything, and people in Illinois will say Chicago runs everything. I'm sure. So, yeah. what's your next topic, priority? <laughs> uh, this is a this one just hit me when I, I heard it. A hundred thousand dollars to get new chairs and tables in your cafeteria. Oh yeah, from the Capitol bill. Yeah, yeah. because Excuse they were flooded. Me. They were stored for the summer yeah. and flooded. Yeah, in so the, they're kind of. Uh, and it's, uh, it's furnished. Just, someone had just said that, but when I, when I read it and heard it, it was like, they, we don't like these. These are old. No, no. we're not. It's no. not to upgrade. Yeah, it's not. And where they're going is is in the dining area because because what what if you have visited the state house recently, uh, what you'll find is it, it, like you'll have a school group or you'll have a, a an issue group or, or something. Flies. They'll come <laughs> and they want to have lunch, and no, there are no chairs sit. in the dining room, yeah. and so so it's not. It's not even so much that the legislators are getting chairs, it's chairs for, okay, for the well, visitors to the state for, house. Yeah. Oh, we're not redecorating. Because yeah. so we have destroyed Actually, that I want one. new curtains. That would be great. <laughs> but it's a good point. And if folks have questions about the capital bill, for example, or the transportation budget bill, which has specific line items in it, feel free to email us. We, I, I saved my budget book for the T bill, which is a transportation bill, and I also saved, I assume most of us did, the line by line that we got on the capital bill. So if there's specific the projects, yeah, I didn't actually save the big bill one. So if you could be that person. Um, but also, Dave, do you get our e-newsletter? Because we could put out in our next, when they, when they do set up that commission, I would hope people would report on it, but perhaps we could also include who gets appointed in our next email, when, when, it, when we do know who they are. I don't think I get it, but I, I, uh, I read something on VLCT oh, about yeah. what's going on, uh, Digger once in a while, yeah. and some stuff, but specifically... In the Valley News. Right, right. 
Valley News, sometime. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I love well, maybe the Valley News, and I, uh, we well, are nice. hoping it will continue to thrive. I also love the Herald of Randall. Well, so thanks. We are so lucky to have the papers one, that we one have. One more thing that I really would like to What say. are the other four then? Uh, we had the, when we had the meeting with the, um, talking about the school budget here in this district, um, we had some very good news. Um, we're not going to be suffering 12.5%. Yes. We're doing much better. And the, the reason that I was told, and again, I only have, I, because I don't have time to go to all the meetings, is that we, we have made some changes so that a lot of those folks that were going to private schools or even to the, what used to be the BAS program, we're now taking care of those children. And parents are bringing them back to our district. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We have more and more. So my, what I'm saying, why I'm saying that is, when people are on, on commissions or committees or whatever you want, maybe they ought to reach out and who's doing well? Yes. And yeah. why are you doing well? Mm. Or why do you believe you're doing well? And let's investigate that. Yeah, that's a great I think suggestion. doing well because of the business model they gave us. In we could be disadvantaged in that Bethel and Royalton have complete responsibility for capital expenditures in our, in our schools. We have the complete responsibility. Do you, do you mind if I just interrupt? I have to leave and go to work. Thank you so much for coming. And when's our next one? January. January. Oh, break. we got the, we got a break. Thank you. Well, that. please don't hesitate to reach out. I'll leave some cards so, over here. Maybe you Thank could you explain. Did. I think it Acts 46 Ciao. came in and did this. I, I, I don't understand why we have two business models. You have one in Woodstock where Woodstock and the eight towns all vote on your budget and all contribute into your capital expenditure budget. Uh, if you want to build a new school, everybody's going to have to approve the bond issue. Not so here. We got Bethel and Royalton. We have our capital expenditures are on us. All right. Fortunately, both our schools had been, had been reasonably well maintained. So when we did the merger, we could, we could do that. I think our business model is quite attractive, to tell you the truth, because we have eight towns around us that are tuitioning students into the schools. And, and in my world, they would keep their school choice, but it would have to be a public school choice, right? Not a private school choice. Because people in Granville, but Europe, they might want to go up to Harwood, up Route 100. They don't, might not want to come down here, and that, that's what they should do. Right? So if, if, we were to, if we were to do that in Bethel, the way we do it in Bethel and Royalton, we lower our tax rate by being good, by being attracting students. And that's why we're, we're going to have a bond issue in the fall for a performing arts center in Royalton that they add on to the school. They got good athletics, they got good academics, they got a really good music program, but no space to really do it. Run so, by a Woodstocker. And, and, and it's a good one. At any rate, my emphasis to people in our community of, of, of Royalton and, and Bethel is to vote yes for this bond issue because this performing arts center is it's going to send more here. students in oh, from these other towns. Absolutely. We have we have the silver lining in the clouds. If yeah. it, if we're good, it's going to be less expensive to our taxpayers, and I think that's really the message that uh, we have to get out. Support our schools, have the kids tuition into them, and we increase the quality of education and we lower our tax rate. And, and I think we can compete with the independent schools. I'd be curious with all the public schools that have gone out of business in the last couple of years. Did any independent schools go out of business? I don't know. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. We lost four in these. We have towns. had a moratorium on, on on accrediting any new public, uh, any new private schools. I do know that. So I don't know how long that at, is. At any rate, I think I think competitive forces favor us. Um, but I'm not sure why in Act 46 do we have two completely different business models. In neighboring supervisor unions, you have one in. in this is in, not my area of expertise, you have one, so I cannot man, answer. You have one in Woodstock that's completely different than the one we have here. It is, I guess. I had not appreciated yeah. that. I've never heard it put quite that way, and no, I, I, I actually either. would need to, to study it more to be. So able, where you're from, in, in, in Woodstock, everybody votes on the budget, and everybody has to vote on the bud, bond issue to build the new school. Correct. All right. Royalton and Bethel, we only vote on our budget, and we have all the responsibility for the capital expenditures, which could seem to be disadvantaged to us at one point, because we have to build a new school, it's on us. But we're forced to attract people into us, which I think is good. I think competition is good. But I am curious <laughs> why we have two completely different models. I cannot answer this question. Yeah. And I've gone into the independent schools camp to read what they are. If you want to figure out what's going on, go to the enemy's camp, all right? <laughs> they want to file lawsuits 
against districts like the one that, that Woodstock is in because your citizens don't have school choice and our citizens do. Well, there we are. Yep. So I'm just, I know, I, I'm just, I I'm just yeah. curious of why there's two completely different models. Every, I think actually everybody has school choice within public school. I think actually that exists. If you uh, want to choose to go to another public school, I believe, I, I, believe, I, I think that you're able to do that. Uh, just because I know that there have been Springfield kids come, who've come to Woodstock and been able to, to do that um, for different programs that we offer that aren't offered at Springfield. Now, so anyway, I think there's, there's, there's some... trade five or six people or something like that does exist. So what do you charge for tuition? I'm just curious what your tuition Well, I think, the, I don't know what we charge. I, the last rate I saw was the 2022-23 rate was 16750 which is what the voucher the state would, would give into a school. The, the voucher comes in at $16,750. That's the statewide average. So if you do that for the six years, the student's there, that's 100000 bucks. So every student you so attract but into your school district brings a hundred grand with them. That's attractive. Well, more students, the lower the tax rate. Yep. That is, that, that is the bottom line. <laughs> so everybody vote yes on the bond issue because it'll increase the quality of the school. It'll when is the vote on that? November. In November. I think we're re-voting our bond issue. Uh, in November, so. September. What are your other four? Three issues. You've gone through three. Well, uh, actually, three of those are all just about the, the educated. The, the interesting one to me was was uh, Becca's talk on the uh, all your maps of your rivers and whatnot. Yeah. I learned that right over here in this school when I was growing up. I can tell you where the rivers used to be and why they're not there now. And the kids over there, they have they have that education still going on there. So, why you folks don't know about that is because they've you're, only you're just educated. finished remapping for flood. It's for flood. It's for the hundred year, five hundred year was, flood. She was alluding to the fact that we don't know why, and I do but know we, why. We, I, I think A and R knows why. It just they have just finished the river corridor mapping so that we can look at uh, an entire river corridor and all the challenges it faces uh, uh, when we have some of these extreme weather Im uh, impacts. So we're, we're trying to okay, look well, at I, it more I, holistically. I just heard something that I said, wait a minute. But, I, I, when I was 10, I was learning about this. Yeah. Right over here. And, but I, may I just add on this, on Act 250, no one's asked about this, but um, one of the exciting things that I'm excited about with the Act 250 update work is that we are going to be asking every community to do their, to making their own choices. Once we land on the definitions for the different tiers and the different abilities to develop, um, each town is going to be, from the ground up, we will be doing the mapping. What areas do you want to have more densely developed? What areas do you want to protect? And each town will be invested in making its future planning choices as many of them are with their planning commissions, but lots, uh, but really investing in, and in, 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 in deciding as a community about what, where it wants to develop and how it wants to develop. And I think that's very exciting, and we're hoping that work will be done by December of 26, I think, is that right? Yeah, um, just before, at the very beginning, uh, Greg asked me about the Act 250 bill, the Act 250 slash housing bill, and, uh, it makes some changes in Act 250. I have, my career has been about Act 250. I started out on the District and, uh, Environmental Commission. I was served on natural resources. I involved defending the State Environmental Board uh, during, in the 90s. Uh, and I think a lot of people are surprised that I voted for this bill. And uh, what it was, well, first of all, the, the Vermont Natural Resources Council supported it, which struck me as strange, and I was available to be educated. I bought their argument, and it, it is that the trade we are giving Act 250 exemptions to designated downtowns. I dislike the concept of an Act 250 exemption because it implies that that's a good thing, it's an incentive, and which would imply that Act 250 is a bad thing, and we're going to let you out of this bad thing if you do what we want. Uh, however, 
the argument is made that there are areas where the environmental protections are already there, which was not the case in 1970 when Act 250 was passed. And there are communities that have their own, their, their water and, and land use regulations, and that they're, if it's solid enough that we should back off Act 250, I've never bought the argument that it's bad for development. Just take a drive and, look and ask yourself everything you go by. Just say one word or the other, old or new. That every building you pass, old or new. And you see, new. The new outnumbers the, the old, like 10 to 1. It's all been built up since Act 250 was passed. However, permitting is time consuming, time is money. We hear from the developers that we can do it faster and cheaper if we are not dealing with Act 250 because we've already got this other permit. We've already dealt with the, with the town. And we do want, the, we do need the housing. And now this would direct the housing where we want it. For the environment, one of the things we get is, is the, uh, well, we, in the original bill, it came out in the conference, unfortunately, was that we would restore, we would recreate the environmental board, which was replaced by appeals going to the courts. I never understood why the developers wanted that. It's time, that's time consuming and expensive, but for some reason they wanted that. Um, and then now they've got it because they asked for it. Um, but on the other hand, we also have something called the, uh, the, uh, the road rule, which is roads of a certain length trigger Act 250. 2000. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on the use. Driveway, multiple, you add up uh, driveways, for example. The idea being that there are contiguous forested areas that we would like to leave as much intact as possible. And the roads indicate that we're going to be start int intruding in, in, into those areas. And a lot of people think that Act 250 jurisdiction means, oh, you can't do it. Act two, you have jurisdiction. People fight jurisdiction. Jurisdiction doesn't mean you can't do it. it means when you do it, do it right. Okay, you, you get you get a review. Pretty much all that new stuff out there either wasn't under jurisdiction in the first place, or if it was, it got the permit. That the getting the the, the road rule extended is a good thing. But the main reason I supported this bill is, and this gets back to, again, mapping. When Act 250 was passed, went into law in 1970, the designers of it, all Republicans, by the way, I'm going to be bipartisan here, Dean Davis, Art Gibb, these were great guys, Vermont Republicans of the old school, um, guys like George Aiken, there was that, that, I'd be a Vermont Republican if they were still like that. And then, of course, it's nothing like that now. But these good old Republicans had this bill where what they envisioned was a mapping of the state and identifying areas that are well suited to development and other areas that are valuable and precious and important and ought to be protected. And by protected, I don't necessarily mean turning them into a, into a state park where there's no development. Again, it's a matter of make sure when you do it, you do it right. That was the original vision, and it never happened. And it's going to happen. And it's going to happen with this bill. That was the original Act 250. And Madeline Kunin got, got a bill through uh, in, in the 80s, Act 200, which was basically saying, okay, let's get back to Dean Davis. Let's do what was originally intended. There was a firestorm against that. People said we were taking away their property rights. I've looked at it with an open heart and an open mind and said, why do you think that? But there was this insistence that we were going to take away their problem. So Act 200 was not repealed, but it was a little by little. It never really happened. What we're going to have now is that the district, uh, the, the um, regional planning commissions will map with the yeah. towns, it, oh yes, only yes, only assisting towns. Well, the, yes. what, the, the regional planning commissions really have no authority. They are advisors to the towns, and they will work, and they will 
basically plot out the state, map the state. We'll have three tiers. Tier The tier one is downtowns where we want to actively encourage development. Then at water and, and sewer. Yeah. Well, well and there's a ver variety of, yeah. of requirements to get into that. Uh, and, and tier two is, is more or less what we've got. And it's going to be the big tier. It's going to be most of the state. And then you get tier three. And tier three is these are the places we want to really pay attention to. And protect. Yeah. And, um, but I do want to be clear, protect does not necessarily mean turn it into Yosemite. Okay, into Vermont land or, you know, into the Vermont National Park. People often talk about us becoming a theme park, and that's not going to happen on our watch anyway. Um, so in any case, I look at it, it, it's risky. I cast a vote, it's not the first time in my career where I've cast a vote and thought, please, God, don't let me end up with regretting this. I believe, I believe I made the right vote. Dick, can I ask, I think I asked this earlier in the year, from a resiliency standpoint, is there a specific plan for Montpelier? I mean, I don't know how many times we can pay to all no. of those really old, huge, gorgeous buildings being underwater three times that I can remember now. And it's like, you know, I know we have to do something with that river, is there a plan for that? that that's the, the river corridors uh, bill, is that really, take which is 10 years? looking. We can't really wait it, 10 years. I yeah, mean. but it's going to take a long time to do the work of creating the, the sponges that will get the, will, will, will siphon off the water before it hits there, addressing the dams that are upstream. I mean, there are a lot of issues uh, as you plan for that resiliency that have to be put into pay, place and paid for. I mean, so that river corridor bill is really the, the backbone of not just Montpelier, you, it's true of Bethel, yeah, it's true of Ludlow, yeah. Port Ludlow. I mean, every, all yeah. most of our downtowns. Actually, Woodstock is actually raised up and not right on its river, although some of it in West Woodstock is. But mo most of our downtowns and village centers are designed around our rivers. Yeah. So we have to do Springfield, the, the fabulous U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Dam has saved Springfield in my in the, my t our time here. Uh, from countless flooding. I mean, it's just been, it, it wasn't touched in Irene. It was like the only major yeah. downtown not touched it just by It just feels Irene. like we're on the clock now. <laughs> like it's going to yeah. happen soon. <laughs> oh, 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 absolutely. But it's going to take us some time to do that, the work of, of the resiliency work. The planning is marching forward. It's the, it's the actually creating the... Montpelier is a, is a particular problem. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, you've actually literally got canals. And you have three you rivers. you got a canal yeah. in, 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 through the middle of Montpelier. Three, three rivers, rivers are coming. It's a constant. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, I mean, Bethel is an example where who is it? Someone, maybe it was Charlie Young, that <laughs> said Bethel never should have, Bethel Village should oh. never have been put where it Everything is. Everything we built is <laughs> in a floodplain. It we doesn't belong here. We just here. put a fire department in a floodplain. Yeah. I mean, good lord. You did. Yeah. 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 Everything is in a floodplain. It just rains and the fire department is sitting in a pond. So We're also, on, as parts of Bethel are on the top of very unstable banks. True. I, I'm a what good. isn't a fire hazard is no. hanging over the river. <laughs> I'm, I'm a good. I'm a good environmentalist. I've always supported letting. Basically, the basic idea is let the river be the river. Okay, right. and 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 de design defensively. Don't try to control the river. Recognize the river is going to do what it's going to do. Right. Now, put your. De well, but meanwhile, you have to balance that with the fact is that things are where they are. Yeah. Whether they should be here or not. If you could go back 400 years, go back to the beginning of the European invasion of North America, <laughs> we would do it all completely differently. Yeah, yeah there's a, a lot. I mean, not just Vermont. A lot of America. The the the, the, the infrastructure is not where it belongs. Well, it but it's then, yeah. but it's here. I advocated. I'm saying I'm a good environmentalist. I advocated for rip wrapping below uh, <laughs> Church Street because it's there. There's house people live there, and it's that you look at that bank; it wants to wash out. You know the, what goes up because that whole ridge there. You know the the, it, the, the, the athletic field floods, <laughs> and the river washes away the the bank. You know downstream of the dam, so there there's no choice unless you want to let the village go 
you're going to have to rip rap that. As obnoxious as rip rapping is, you got to do that. And and it's that kind, those kinds of decisions. What we do with Montpelier, boy. It, it, well, a, it begs the question, challenge. what are you going to do in Bethel? Because where else are you going to put development in Bethel? I mean, what's not on the river? Right. I mean, look around. There's a reason our population has been stable for over 100 <laughs> years. There's no place else to There's live. There's nowhere to go. But speaking of the new Act 250 sure. bill, the, the Act Most 250 things. housing bill, I've got to say I use Bethel as an example of the kind of emphasizing development where you want it, which is you look at some of the newer houses. The instinct for people is to just sprawl. Everyone wants their house in the middle of 10 acres after a long driveway. You look at go out along the back road to Royalton, you know, it was, you're adjacent, the development is adjacent to the existing village. You know, and it was rather than have, here's the village and now we're going to have development out there, is that the, like, no, the village has grown. Of course, the other thing is Bethel Village is so is on the Royalton line, so that you're actually in Royalton when you think you're in Bethel. Yes. But uh, but the idea is, is that you have an existing developed area, you make that a little bigger, rather than having this develop and then make another development right. there. And most of our small villages developed next to the waterfall, because right. that's where the mill went. Yeah. And commerce de developed around there, so we were next to the river to start with. So oh, that's true. Yeah. Go down Route Most towns in Vermont started that way. Follows the river. Go down Route 12. Yeah, yeah. It follows yes. the river. I mean, they're all right on the river. Transportation right? corridors and the rivers were where you want to put a new yeah. building is on a damn river. When, when I, I used to teach Vermont history, and, and I would say, we are the Green Mountain State. And the mountains define our souls, and we love the mountains. But Vermont history has almost nothing to do with the mountains. Yeah. We are a valley people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a history, all, it all happened in the valleys. Yeah. And yeah. the transportation is through the valleys. And that's true. Here we are in the valley, <laughs> right, right here. Well, the stage routes actually didn't go along the valleys. They avoided the valleys because they Mud. couldn't afford but the stage approach routes, routes were second after the river quarters, which is how they first yeah. traveled by river. Well, they tried to stay away from the water, you know, the old roads, some of the ancient, so called right. ancient roads. Because they experienced through, the same thing. Went through the hills, yeah, they knew how to get. Well, you look at the interstate, it's perfect for, for sightseeing. It's horrible during a storm, but it's great as soon as the storm's over. That's the way I always looked yeah. at the interstate. Thank you, Danny. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, it's five of us. We're right now. Here. We are. Yeah. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so well, thank much. thank you for organizing it's a, it. It's a huge you. commitment for you to haul yourself here at 7 I know, it's not my finest hour. <laughs> Easy for me. <laughs> I got to admit it. Yeah, so I don't know if we have to rethink that when you're You not two have a very anymore. short you should all have grown up on a farm so that four o'clock in the morning was normal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not, this is late. It's not normal for me. Normal it's not normal. Like a big good time to go to bed. It's fine because on a farm you would have gone to bed before midnight, which is what I did last night. <laughs> well, I'm old, so four in the morning is normal for me now too. Yeah, but we have enough sense to go back to bed. Yeah, yeah, I, it's all the fun stuff right happens there. at night if you ask me. Sorry, uh, <laughs> I miss it. There. You can have more. If you're hearing from me at nine o'clock, something happened bad because I think usually oh. something pours on. Well, again, thank you. Uh, this is a yeah. wonderful commitment. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you to the hardcore that come all the time, which yeah. is great, and to some new faces, which is wonderful. And we will look forward to next January. We'll be in touch. About and I'll be here as a citizen. Well, thank yeah, you. and we could also, uh, you know, maybe meet after the. I'll be sitting over travel. there, giving the legislators a rough time. hard time, <laughs> peppering well, you with questions. Can, can I ask one more quick question? I hope it's quick. Yeah. Uh, I seem to be very excited about the veto. Um, I'm, I'm not excited uh, about yeah. vetoes. I'm, I think say, they, I, I'm, I'm concerned if you're excited about vetoes. <laughs> we're not excited about vetoes okay. because I think they, it, when the governor vetoes a bill, it, it's a failure of our being able to work together productively. So we have worked really hard to match some of his concerns and answer his concerns in most of the bills he had the greatest concerns in. So I would hope that actually he wouldn't veto, and I hope we have no veto session. 
it just, um, it's, and it's, but, and he at the moment has vetoed more bills than any other governor in the history of Vermont and more, which is just astonishing to me. So that to me is not successful working together, which and, and while I'm not a to. proponent of our governor, I will say that uh, the times have, I, I believe the times have caused him to have that, have that record. There's been so many more difficult, hard things going on. I don't agree, Dave. Every year we have difficult financially, things. Financially, I mean, we're talking about uh, having making difficult decisions. You folks do difficult decisions up there all the time, but it's not out of your pocket. But every session, but, because has if if I don't have enough money to do something at my uh, house, I have to make a difficult decision. Which oh, may absolutely. Be, which may be absolutely the kids don't get new shoes this this right, or I don't go downtown to get bread. I do without, and it, it feels that the legis our state legislature says, we're going to give everything to everybody. I know it's not true, but, it, but it, we can't, it, we can't. I know, but we still have the money. But you don't have the money, so there's a, I think there's some more things that you could say, no, we no, can't do that. Dave, Dave, we say no a lot, all the time. We say no in a way that is heartbreaking. You, you heard from the governor that we're spending too much. Yeah. Listen to the advocates for children, the advocates for, for the, the homeless. homeless, the ad, I mean, the fact is we do what we can. Uh, Jane Kitchell is the chair of Senate Appropriations, and she uh, quotes a phrase from the Bible. It's not a whole statement, but the reference to, and it shows up often in Exodus, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Oof, yes. And when I served on appropriations, she would say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but we must, you have to harden your heart. Which is hard because... That's, that's what we do. We decide, I served on a. <laughs> we would meet and decide, okay, who are we going to say no to today? But, Dave, you're right. Vermonters have big hearts, and Vermonters do want to help each, we want to help each other, so we want to do as much work in mental health and addressing the opioid crisis and addressing the homeless. There's no question we have a big heart, and it's it's hard to say no. Well, and, and uh, the problem I see is, is not what we want to do; it's how much it costs. And we need we I think you folks I don't know and I don't know how and I may be out of line. Someone's got to figure out why it costs so goddamn much <laughs> and how to fix that. I mean. I'm not, I'm getting Social Security, okay? My supplement plan went up 41% this exactly. year. 41%. What else went up 41%? Not my Social Security, that went up 3.2%. Exactly. Hey, you got a great raise. Well, it just well, got all I mean, sucked up somewhere, and now I have less money than I had before. Inflation <laughs> is a huge challenge for us, and it has been, when we look at those school budgets, inflation was an incredible driver in a lot of our budgets as was the state, this statewide negotiation for the health care. Well, that didn't help us much. 16.4% increase in health care costs for school, oh, for teachers and staff. I mean, that, or, 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 to go back to Dick's point, that those are not costs we control anymore. You know, the, that is beyond I'm our... Sure. No, that's the school board, though. Right. No, when you talk about local statewide. control of spending, 12 years no. on the school board, we controlled very little spending. That's exactly. Very that's little was in our I control. I got 13 years right behind. So... Yeah. One, yeah. I would like to just bring up one more thing, because yeah. Greg was talking about portability of money going from public to private yeah. schools and not allowing it. One of the bigger issues, too, myself coming from financial aid, is ESAC. We allow portability, and every once in a while that rears its head. It does. It goes nowhere. Nobody has said no to that, ever. Right. And I thought for sure when Don Vickers stepped down that something would change. It has not. You so mean it, it, money well, it flows out of student. state. It, it goes where the student wants it to go. It follows the student. It follows the student. It, it, well, it, then uh, why shouldn't it follow it, the students to private school? It has, so, you know, I mean, this is sort of the same argument. You know, if people want what they want, that's the same argument. Yeah, but it's public taxpayer dollars, the separation of church and state. It, the, the well, line it's for what me people is with want, and then schools. public schools need to do a better job so that students want to go there and parents want to send their kids there. Well, um, it's also a catch-22. That could be, but the VSAC, more, back to... What Dave was saying is that if you don't have the money, keep it, 
to ourselves. You know, why is VSAC sending money out of state? Five I minutes. saw Five that as a financial aid director. Value. Other states are not doing that. They're not. They're not yeah. allowing their state dollars to go out of yeah. state. Mike, Mike we well, do. actually, there's about a dozen states that do it. Right? And usually, but they're very small. It's right. like a two hundred dollar tax. It's not seven thousand If you look at the percentage of our uh, like of financial has. education dollars that go to portability for VSAC as a percentage of our total um, uh, financial aid package, we are off the charts. We are such an outlier in this country. We're like eighteen to twenty percent. You come up to the next one, they're like twelve percent, and then there's a hand. Most states will only give you portable dollars if you're going for a program that's not available in your yeah, state. Right. Right. Or and, a very nominal and we don't fee. Do like that. Some of them are two hundred dollars, know, like Maine. Or Vizek has this mantra: we support students, not buildings. Well, you it's and I saw like, that it's manifest like itself at Vermont Tech when we went for years without a capital expenditure budget. Sure for the last four or five years I was there, when students took a shower in two of our dorms in the lower forms, floors, the gray water came up through the drain and soaked their feet. That's how they started their day. So when VZEC says we support children, not buildings, they're absolutely correct. Because I think that whole policy of $5 million a year going out of state has led to the demise of our state college system. Yep. Yep. My committee, we are specifically in education per se, commerce, economic development, but we spent but we spent a lot of time, um, you know, setting up, you know, uh, forgivable loan programs for nurses and and you know and those kinds of programs and and that was a piece that we we spent a lot of time arguing about was was in particular my committee was was saying we we were not fans of the portability of of VSAC money that it really if we're trying to get more of Improved workforce in Vermont, uh, then then why would we give kids money to go out of state where they're going to get established there, perhaps not come back unless it's a program that we don't offer yeah. in Vermont. Uh, but even then, if you have a forgivable loan program or something like that, you, then part of the forgivableness is they have to come back. Um, you know, and so we were trying or to stay build. Here for two years. Yeah, yeah we, they have to come back for a couple of years. So we we're trying to build in those kind of programs. Precisely because, at least in my committee, we were not we we're not in favor of the portability of the VSAC if we're trying to build the Vermont. There was a whole outside study done of Vermont higher education financing done, and they recommended just that. But it gets it gets ignored from my perspective when it hits this the is legislature. Not a Can you say recently? why it was ignored? Why why is VSAC portability held sacred? Why is that such a? I have to go to work. You all. Yeah, no, we do. Why is that? It's held harmless from being. I don't, yeah. I don't serve on education, and I have not no, been part of those did. conversations. No, no, I know. And, and, and the, the issue during my tenure as, as chair and on the committee was, was just rarely raised at all. I I'd always heard it discussed. And, and the idea was we're a very little state. If you were in New York State, whatever it is you want to do, that you can probably do it in New York. In Vermont, maybe yes, maybe no. And that... that we we are just a small state, and we wanted to support our kids in whatever way we could. And if that involves supporting their education out of state, then that they're still Vermont kids. You can make the argument that we've greased the skids for a lot of for our people to leave because seven, yeah. out, seven yeah. out of ten of them don't come back. And then we have another program where we're paying them ten thousand dollars for people to move here. Yeah. No. Is that still going on? No, I don't think so. That's no, that, that's, that's sundown. That's gone. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, folks. Well, have a nice day. Okay. Thanks again, Richard. Thank you. I didn't give you a very satisfying answer. And no. I, and I get it. <laughs> no, I, I get it. That's okay. Yeah. You're all done. Your well. your mind is somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> hey, congratulations. Yeah, I got a call. I need an electrician. I'll be in call. <laughs> You can call me. I don't know if I can uh, answer the question or not. I don't. It depends on what you want. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you. Thank you for the thanks. I sure hear from people when they're mad. <laughs> so.